Hello everyone, today is Thursday, May 21st, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I'm out of Mountain Dew this week, so I'll just have to get excited and energetic on my own. There's the uh, disclaimer screen, as you know, you could lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, we do have a short in the portfolio, one little lonely short, but I got to thinking that uh, maybe now is a good time to talk a little bit about shorting, even though the market's kind of hanging in there. It's never uh, it's never too late to, to mention the short side, and, and there's some great things about the short side in that it helps you to see both sides of the market. And even if a market is at new highs, it's probably a good um, idea to um, to know how to short, and I'm going to flesh that out in a lot more uh, detail. That's the main thing I want to talk about. We also want to uh, I also want to do a little uh, looking at the portfolio and give you some gleamings on that. Uh, some things, uh, even though it's doing really well, there's some things I do want to point out to you on that. Uh, also, Memorial Day sales going to start tomorrow, and um, I'll be putting those things up. Uh, shortly and you'll see that towards the end so we should have plenty of time this week to get to all your questions so feel free to um, shoot me some questions while we're in this also uh, just give me a few minutes uh, to get through the slides and then we can start asking about individual stocks so once we get to the charts you can do that and once we do if you don't mind just ask about one stock at a time you can ask about as many stocks as you want let's just do it one stock at a time yeah i'm having some withdrawals here he says um I'm having withdrawals about the um, about no diet coke. Okay, let's just jump right into things. Let me just show you this short and and what I was thinking. And it's kind of interesting. You get this. Um, the beauty of technical analysis is things begin to happen, and then the news then follows, and that's a pretty cool thing. And I ran out of time. There was another um, airline that I wanted to put up, and I and, and I had it, and I forgot to make a chart. I got busy with some other stuff, but. Um, let me see if I can make this pen work. Uh -oh. Talk amongst yourselves. Here we go. Okay. Now, again, I woke up thinking about the beauty of technical analysis this morning and that these airlines all tanked yesterday, but it's not like it should have been a big surprise if you've been watching the charts. Now the Chinese airs have been hanging in there, so they, they don't count. But if you go and look at all these airlines, with the exception of JetBlue, which is a TKO, which could turn into something much bigger, but right now it's just a TKO. We'll take a look at it. Love, that's the one. Thank you. Yeah, this is the one I wanted to talk about, but at the last minute and getting my slides ready and all, let's see if I can find it. Thank you so much, uh, John. Yeah, love. I wanted to talk about love, and I meant to make a chart. But notice that we had a nice little bow tie here off of a double top. This would have been a beautiful example to write on. I guess I still can do it uh, when we get to the charts. But you can see nice little bow tie down, and it had a nice little sell-off out of this formation. But, again, a double top here, a bow tie down. And a lot of times off of all-time highs, you get that bow tie down, and it can be a significant pattern. So, uh, I had picked UAL, and the reason I picked it because it's going sideways for a while. And those of you who know me know that I like inefficient stocks. And this is a very efficient stock. Efficient meaning that it's thick, it's high in volume, it's well analyzed. There's probably a ton of analysts following this uh, company. So, thank you, John. I appreciate that. Um, so, it's efficient and efficient. Yeah, easy for me to say. An efficient stock. Um, they, are, they also have things like quantifiable fundamentals. You can get, you have a pretty good idea that they, you know what airlines cost a lot. You know what fuel costs a lot. You know what labor unions cost a lot, what gates cost a lot. You know, there's all these things that factor in. And they're also kind of one-dimensional. So I'm kind of building a case here for the, the GoGo Nomo, which I'm going to talk about in just one second where you have these efficient stocks at high levels, and when they begin to crack, they can really crack 
in earnest. And I'll flesh it out in a little more detail. Now, this isn't the cleanest pattern in the world. The I guess the love in hindsight would have been a little bit cleaner pattern to trade. But I did like the way that it formed this um, nice little wide and loose, sort of wide and loose base in here. Like everything was fine in the world. And sometimes sometimes you get these setups where you, you kind of have to squint your eyes a little bit and and see that, okay, well, even though it's not the most beautiful, cleanest setup in the world, it did make this big base in here. And once it begins to break down from that base and pull back a little bit, anyone who bought in this base will be inclined to get out of break even in and when and if it begins to rally back up to that level. How many times I have to tell you I do a short chart show every day on Thursday? Not every day, every Thursday. So that was my thinking there. And I may have drawn this line a little too big here. But if you take this out right here, you just look at this backwards. You had a nice little breakdown from this range and a little bit of a pullback. And it also has a little, little bit of that inverted cup and handle look, which can be a very powerful pattern. Now, it did trigger. I think it triggered right in here. And, of course, it just kind of went up a little bit before it began to slide. And then yesterday, it began to slide in earnest. So these topping patterns can be really good if you're in something like a one-dimensional company. I'm a little nervous, at least at this juncture, to rush out and short something like a biotech that might come out with a new drug or have some big news announcement right as you get short, okay? But something like an airline, I, and I always used to joke, my, my system for airlines is wait till they go up, then short them. It's just a horrible business. I love to fly. I love to travel, but um, it's just a horrible business to be in. Now, I don't want to confuse issue with facts, but that does seem to be like a viable system <laughs> for those. So anyway, the point is you had a lot of overhead supply. It begins to break down, pulls back a little bit. Not the cleanest pattern in the world, but when you're shorting something like UAL, a big, thick, efficient stock, you're not going to necessarily get that most cleanest pattern in the world. It is kind of fascinating, like we're just talking about this love in here, that it did have, just like UAL began to break down, Love began to break down long before the bad news came out. And you can see a nice little bow tie down in that one. Okay. Now, I was looking for some – a lot of times I have a habit of reinventing the wheel and starting from scratch with commentary. And in more recent times, I just realized, you know, I've got, oh, I don't know, a decade and a half worth of commentary out there in slideshows and – um, webinars and all these other things. So now I just kind of, first thing I do is I search to see what I've done in the past. And then I dug this email up from about a year ago. And this was right about the time the IPO webinar, we did the IPO webinar. And he says, uh, thanks for the IPO webinar last Sunday. I really enjoyed it. It felt like I picked up a lot of stuff in that four hours. I was wondering if it's possible to spare a little bit of time in this Thursday chart show to share your experience and problems encountered during the actual shorting what you can't see in paper trades. And this is a, this is very um, this is a very important thing that this gentleman is saying here. A lot of times things will work on paper. Like I've seen uh, situations where you could go out and short a bunch of options. And you could show somebody, well, look, I could have shorted all these options and made a fortune. So we need to we should run this shorting option system. It's like, okay, well that's that sounds like a, something pretty exciting. Well, what you're not seeing in those paper trades is that maybe the margin could have changed and then you could not have held those options until expiration, okay? Or maybe when those options went against you by X amount of money between now and expiration, you would have been forced out of those options due to margin requirements or whatever. OK, so there's a lot of things that are unforeseen in the paper trading. Do paper trade, do learn how to trade paper trading. But then eventually you got to put real dollars on the line. And number one, so you can feel those those great emotions that come with trading, right? Trading, right? And um, the main the other reason, too, is so you could you could be grounded in reality. OK, not just psychological reality but the logistical reality of the markets. And like I'll often say, getting back to the psychology is, I've never, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. Now, 
of course, as soon as I said that, somebody says, well, I'm not successful as a paper trader. It's like, well, how long have you been trading? You know, two weeks. Okay, well, all right. Well, maybe if you've been trading a couple of weeks, you're unsuccessful uh, because you haven't learned the market yet. But if you've studied the market seriously, there's a pretty good chance that you're probably a successful paper trader. It's just when you go to put the real money on the on, on line, money on the lines, you, you learn about things like margin, logistics, um, execution, slippage, and all these other wonderful things that come along with putting real money on the line, not to mention the psychology involved, okay? So he's saying uh, there's limited information available. He'd rather hear it from me. Thank you. Uh, for example, a short squeeze, okay? Is it uh, common even in big cap stocks? Yeah, it can happen. And we'll talk about that in just one second. Uh, chances of being bought in, I'll explain that. And uh, what if your broker increases margin requirements on existing short positions and other shenanigans that may occur? Well, the good thing is if you're short something and it's dropping, your margin, if it's going in the right way, your margin actually goes down in uh, those particular cases because you put up a lot more money than what you're uh, doing, and then you can create uh, money. Shea says high-frequency trading. You talk about it on the short side? You know, it's kind of something interesting was said, and uh, I always get something good out of these shows. And um, I forget who said it, but it might have been, uh, if you watched last week's uh, show for the um, timing research, if you go to my YouTube channel and, and look at my likes, it's there. I think it was uh, Wiz, who's um, TopGunOptions.com. I think that's his website. Uh, he was talking about the high frequency trading. And then right now, his point is that the high frequency traders are on the long side, the buy side, but they could change their algorithms to be on the short side. So that's something that's fascinating that uh, could actually happen. So that's uh, it's always, like I said, I always get something good out of these shows. But anyway, so yeah, high frequency trading could have impact on the markets. Uh, in an ideal world, you would short a stock, and then it would slide, and then pull back maybe a little bit, and then it'd slide, pull back a little bit. And even in these pullbacks, you could actually use those to uh, sort of sweep trade around that core position. I don't want to get into that too much today because that's not the, the what I was thinking about uh, covering. But anyway, the reality is a lot of times it's like you get in them, and then all of a sudden they have a sharp retrace rally, and then they begin to implode, and then even if you could hang on, it seemed to like knock you out. So it's very hard to stay with a short position because they uh, they'll rush in and short the, the market. Shea says high HFT can make it difficult to buy and sell at a price. Well, I, I don't think so. I think if you're trying to trade within a penny, which is a bad idea, that HFT can mess you up. But I don't think as a general statement, most of my trades are putting in at the market. Um, I know of people who have methodologies where their execution is crucial and they're successful in what they do and God bless them. But you try to follow along and if you don't have that broker where you can get in between the spread to this penny, to that penny or whatever, you'll never make a dime. Even though they're making money, your execution is so crucial. Now, I don't hate to use the word sloppy, but with my stuff, you could be a little bit more sloppy because hopefully you're in that position for weeks, months, and if not, if, you, if things work out great, you're in there for years. So I don't think the HFT really has that big of uh, uh, makes it that big of a difference, unless you're day trading, which I suggest you don't do. But anyway, the point is that you get short, and then of course you get a big retrace rally. Shorts are quick to cover; they're quick to get out of the way when things begin to go against them. Short people who short the market are more trader types. They also tend to be a more fickle bunch. They don't hang on. And as soon as things begin to go against them a little bit, they get out. And somebody once said, um, oh, I make money on the short side, but uh, I don't get caught in re retrace rallies because it, as soon as I have uh, any signs of adversity, I get out. Well, I doubt very seriously he's making any money on the short side because it seems like the old Wall Street adage, all shorts go against you, seems like that's fairly true. And even if they just go get you a little bit before they begin to implode, which they all seem to do, then you would exit. For instance, let's just go back to this um, UAL example. Um, I think we got in like right here, and you can see it kind of went against us for a little while before it began to work. And this only really began to pay off last uh, last day or so in here, I guess yesterday. So you can't get out at the slightest signs of adversity. You have to have 
some sort of stop, but you have to give them a lot of room to breathe, okay? So shorts are real pain, so this has gotten me thinking. And again, we don't want to rush out and short this market as long as it's at our new highs. But every now and then an opportunity like UAL may present itself. These transports are beginning to break down in here. Maybe something interest rate sensitive will begin to break down with the bonds continuing to slide. We'll take a look at that in one second. So it doesn't hurt to keep an eye out for shorts, and it might actually help your portfolio out a little bit. And one cool thing that can happen, and this doesn't happen often, but I keep going back to 2007, in October 2007, the market was at all-time highs, bases the P's, and I couldn't find any longs to save my life. And I started apologizing to my clients. I know you guys who know me are probably, your eyes are glazing over, because I tell a story about once every um, 20 minutes. But anyway, bear with me. So I began to apologize to my clients, like, guys, I know the market's at new highs, but I'm really having trouble finding any meaningful longs, and here's a short that I found. And then same sort of thing, rinse and repeat over the next few days, few weeks, few months. And we started getting stopped out of our longs, and our shorts started making money. Now, that doesn't always happen, but it can be a thing of beauty when it does. You kind of make this nice little smooth transition your drawdowns are somewhat mitigated because as your longs are going down, your shorts begin going up. Now, I don't want to suggest that I was hedging because I was not. I think hedging is a bad idea. I don't want to get into that too much today. But in general, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think hedging works. It works great on paper. Again, getting back to that paper and theory thing. Uh, it, what is it? In theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. Well, hedging is great on paper okay well we put this hedge on and if the market goes down our hedge goes up but you're going to lose money on your positions but you're going to make money on the hedge so you kind of break an even oh that sounds great okay well but if the market goes up you're going to lose money on the hedge so the money you make on the market going up you lose on the hedge so now you're back to break even and then you got to set reset your hedge up a little higher to get rehedged and that's going to cost you more money so a hedge will keep you from making money on the long side. It might help you from losing as much money on the long, on the short side, or I should say uh, not the short side, as the market begins to roll over. But it's going to keep you from making money on the long side. So I'm not suggesting that you hedge when the market is at high levels like it is. But if you see a short setting up and everything's there, the pattern's there, and you have a reason to short it, I mean, pattern is first and foremost, but the other reason would be, the other reason would be that there's something like the Go Go Nomo strategy at work, where it's a single dimensional company and it's an efficient company and everything is kind of priced into the stock, which I'll elaborate on in just one second. So the question is, is shorting really worth it? It's a real pain, okay? Is it really worth it? Probably not, okay? As a general statement, if, if you put a gun to my head, and my wife hates when I say that, but put a gun to my head, is shorting worth it? Eh. As a general statement, probably not. But there are some advantages. Obviously, I just talked about one of them is that the market does go down. You can actually not only – not only um, I don't want to say protect your investment, but not only stop from losing money, but you can actually make some money. The good is they do slide faster than they glide, okay? So if you get into a stock, you get into it just right, it's a little transitional pattern. Let's uh, let's do like a bow tie or invert a cup and handle, first throw, so whatever. You get in just right, bam, market begins to implode. You can make a lot of money really fast. That's a good thing. The bad thing is they slide faster than they glide. Sometimes it's hard to get on board. Sometimes on the long side, like something bottoms out, begins to rally, okay? Let's say you miss the first little leg up. Well, guess what? You'll get a second leg. There'll be a second chance in a lot of cases to get on. On the short side, not so much, okay? So it really could be a snooze or lose type of situation. So that can be pretty tough, especially if you're waiting for some sort of confirmation. It's kind of darned if you do and darned if you don't. You see a nice little short setting up at high levels. If you don't take it, what happens? The market implodes. Seems like if you do take it, then it goes back on to make new highs. So it's it's kind of a tough and perverse way to make money in a market. So again, it's kind of like, Darn if you do and darn if you don't in questionable conditions. 
Uh, the aforementioned retrace rallies, again, could be a real pain in the butt talks. Now, the question was, what happens with the buyback? And this is, um, it's a little hard to get your head wrapped around, but it's pretty simple if you look at a buyback in terms of an individual. Let's say Bob buys 100 shares. And then let's say you borrow from Bob and sell short Bob's 100 shares. Okay. So 100 were bought and you borrowed those 100 shares. Okay. And you sold them. So if you do the math on that, Bob bought 100. Okay. You sold 100. You're at zero. So this is Bob's shares and you borrowed from Bob. Okay, so now you're at zero. Okay, everything's everything's kind of in balance. But what gets confusing is Bob sells his shares, and unbeknownst to him, that they have been borrowed and shorted. So he doesn't know they've been borrowed and shorted. Okay, so Bob sells his shares. So now Bob's you borrowed a hundred from Bob. Now Bob sells a hundred shares. Okay, minus one hundred. The hundred he bought that's zero. Minus one hundred. Now you're at a deficit, so it doesn't balance out, okay? So now you have two sales equaling, equaling $200. You sold 100 shares short, and, or you sold 100 share, shares short, sell short, and then Bob sold his 100 shares. So now you're short. There are, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confusing things. There are 200 shares that have been sold, but only 100 shares were actually bought, okay? So those 100 shares have to be replaced, so they have to buy them back, okay? So a lot of this happens behind the scene, and it's not necessarily you and Bob doing the transaction. But the point is that if there are, let's say there are 500,000 shares that are, that are um, sold short, and then let's say 200 get get sold outright, okay, let's see, these are sold short and these are sold outright, okay, meaning that somebody actually owned these shares and then sold them, you could end up with a deficit of 200 shares that need to be replaced. So hopefully that makes sense. So they're going to start forcing you out of your position to replace those shares. Now, allegedly what happens is when this happens, they try to figure out a way to juggle it all and replace your shares. But sometimes they'll actually be caught and you get actually caught in what's called a buyback. So, again, it's a, the world's a lot more complicated than it might appear on the surface. So you might have a great shorting strategy, but what they fail to realize is you could end up with a buyback in that strategy. Okay. Um. I don't want to digress too far into it, but whenever I've been caught in a buyback, what I've done is I, I wonder, um, and you hate to say this, but sometimes you have to wonder in markets if they're manipulated, or if there's manip manipulation. So what I'll do is I'll buy like an end of money put, provided that the stock position is still viable and I don't want to lose my position. I'll buy an end of money, end of money put just in case there's some shenanigans that are happening okay there's also some logistics and those logistics mainly would be borrowing you have to borrow the shares before you can short it you can't do what's called naked shorting some people do it some people get away with it through an offshore account in bahamas or some other sh sort of shell game but you're not supposed to do that so, as I said a minute ago, you can only make 100% on a short position because it can only go to zero. Now, you can maybe reshort some shares along the line, along, along the way. And technically, your margin is increasing. And sometimes, one advantage, and this happened years ago when rates were a lot higher, um, depending on your level of account, you might be able to get a little interest on that uh, margin money that you're holding on that short position, okay? So that is a good thing too. Now, are they unnecessarily evil? I think the answer to this is yes, okay? Now, if you tell me tomorrow I could never short again, I, I, it wouldn't kill me. Well, 
it would bum me out a little bit. Okay. But shorting is definitely not my favorite thing to do due to all those aforementioned problems, specifically the retrace rallies. Everything else you can kind of you can kind of work around all that, but there's no good solution for the retrace rallies. And then you will make a lot of money here and there on the short side, but then by the time you add it all up, it's like you do to an extent, or at least I personally, makes you wonder, well, was it really worth it? And I was kind of pondering that thought when I woke up this morning, and one of the things that I came up with is that, yeah, it's worth it in some cases. Like a 2008, when you actually ended up in the black for the year and the market ended down 50%, then on a relative basis, your performance is unbelievably phenomenal. If you're running a fund and you make, let's say, low double digits or low single or high single digits or whatever the case may be was in a year like 2008, they'll put you on the front of um, on the magazines for best fund manager in the world. OK. And you could do that as a private trader. Uh, you're not forced to be long only or have to get permission to sell short or whatever the case may be. So there are some advantages sometimes to being a private trader. And shorting is can be one of them, okay? But I don't want to sugarcoat it. It's not the easiest thing in the world. On paper, it looks beautiful. Oh, look, the stocks just implode. Okay, I remember when I first discovered shorting, it's like all my stocks were going down anyway because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, well, this shorting thing will be great, you know, so it sort of shorted stocks sort of going up. And I'm, I quickly realized that, wait a minute, this is uh, this market game is not that easy. But we do get paid to trade, okay? And, and as I would say quite a bit, it's a Steve Winwood trade. When you see a chance, you take it. So if you see a good-looking short setting up, then you take it, Okay. This is the beauty of it. If there's only one thing you walk away with today, it's this right here. It does force you to see both sides of the market, okay? And I have the privilege of knowing a lot of people in the industry. And without pointing out, pointing fingers at anyone, the point is you rarely meet a bearish long only guy. The class always seems to be a little half full. Maybe they're a little cautious here or there. Or maybe they're not as bullish as they normally are. But they're almost always bullish, okay? And they, they get paid to buy stocks, and they have no choice but to buy stocks. So they're not going to run around being negative all, negative, negative all day. They're probably going to be at least a little half full when it comes to the market, glass half full, okay? Uh, like I just said, it can help to mitigate damages during turns, okay? Now, we saw this one little short setting up. We liked it. We took it. But we, we took it. We took it. And then we started seeing some more long setups. So we kept buying and buying and buying. And we just had this one little lonely short. But sometimes, like I said a minute ago, what will happen is you'll put a short on and you'll get stopped out of a long. And then you don't see any more longs that look viable. And you see another short. You put a short on. And done properly, it could be this nice little ebb and flow where you transition from being long to short. Shorts start making money, longs losing money, but the longs start stopping out, and the shorts start hitting profit targets. So you're kind of making this nice little transition as the market begins to roll over, and it could really be a thing of beauty. Now, again, last time we only had one short that presented itself, and we only took that one short. But sometimes, like I said earlier, you'll start seeing more and more shorts and fewer and fewer longs, okay? And then, obviously, it's the only game in town during the bear market. Now, if you want to sit on your hands and watch the market go down for a year or a year and a half or two years, whatever the case may be, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you just be willing to st get stopped out of your lungs and then just relax and, and go off and have some fun and take some time off. And, and But just don't try to make something happen. Don't try to bottom fish during a bear market until you start seeing some transitional setups on the upside, some new emerging trends. Then, by all means, go in and start buying again, okay? But in that meantime, that meantime can be pretty long. What you might want to do is you might want to put a few shorts on, okay? And, you know, this I left this in. This was written. All of This whole slide was written um, back in uh, July of, of 2014, last year, right around the time I did the um, – the IPO course, and that's why that IPO course was mentioned. 
And the thing is, the question is, $64,000 question is, have too many people become dependent on the Fed to feed the flames? And and the answer to that is, I think yes. And I think there's some performance anxiety on the long side from those people who haven't gotten in, gotten around to buying stocks since 2009. So at some point, it's going in badly, okay? And if we're willing to see both sides of the market as traders, I think we will be ready. So talking out of both sides of my mouth. Is shorting really worth it? Eh, that's a that's a tough that's a tough thing to answer. I say yes, but it's a very qualified yes. Okay, but I do think it's a necessary evil, and I think if you only walk away with one thing by learning how to short, you really can see both sides of the market. Okay, Cliff says I was a stockbroker for many years ago. I was a stockbroker many years ago and couldn't convince my clients to short in a bear market. I kept telling them, and guess what? I finally convinced them at the bottom, such as life. I quit bring a st <laughs> being a stockbroker soon thereafter. Yeah, um, you know, Walter Deemer once said, and Walter Deemer uh, is a tech, has been a, um, he still is, he's a technician for some of these uh, big firms. I forget which firms he's he's been with, but um, he's an older gentleman, very nice guy. He's got a book or two out there. And, uh in one of his books, he wrote, when it's time to buy, you won't want to. When it's time to sell, you won't want to, okay? Meaning that when the market is imploding like it did towards the uh, beginning, I guess, of 2009, when it's just beginning to come unglued and, and it's been going down forever, at that particular point in time, I'm a trend follower, so I'm going to still hold on, but one has to wonder – if it has ran its course, and that's uh, Deemer's point, is 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 the old adage of blood to streets and everything. Like, okay, this might be the end of it. Uh, conversely, when stocks are going straight up like they were in early 2000 and late 1999, right when it feels its greatest, as a trend follower, yeah, keep following along because it might go for another couple of years. But it, when it really feels good and really feels easy, you have to wonder if things may be coming to an end. So yeah, that's what your client, it's just human nature. It's like they've seen the market go down for so long, they finally think, okay, I got it. I got it now. Yeah, it's just going down. Okay, I get it. Yeah, it's been going down for two and a half years. Oh, okay. Yeah, the short thing, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, let's get, let's get short some stocks. And of course, that's when the um, market begins to rally and squeezes them right out. The market can be a really bad teacher, but if you can put your ego aside and just follow along, okay, and you can think about it and say, well, this market is in this blow-off mode, and it's probably done in 1998, but I'm going to keep following along as long as it's going up. Like, like I think I wrote in the first book. There was a trader who was very bearish, and so I asked him when he's short, and he's like, well, I'm not short anything. He's like, well, you're bearish. He goes, yeah, but the market's going up. This was in 98, at 99, and then finally in 2000, he starts shorting. And the reason he was long was because the market is going up. So it's very hard to put your ego aside. It's very hard to not interject logic into the situation. So it's okay to think about the market, but don't necessarily act if that acting – is based on some sort of logic or thinking. Um, we're probably getting towards the end of our bull market run here, but I'm not going to rush out and get super bearish. Again, if I see a chance, maybe I'll take it, okay, on the short side. But I'm not going to get super bearish as long as the market in general keeps going up. And I do want to show you something, uh, something real simple there too. I just had an article come out for Proactive Magazine. And uh, hopefully we'll have time. We'll get to that. Let me just uh, make a quick note uh, on that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about GoGoNomo. You can get this on my website. I'm going to add it to the free reports first chance that I get. I tried to do it this morning, but it's something that's not easily done on the fly. But if you dig through, if you go to education and then uh, scroll down to free education and then dig through the site, you can find it. But it's kind of buried along. So I'm going to put it in the free reports uh, section uh, really soon. But the Goganomo is the strategy. And 
you know, it's kind of, I thought about it this morning. It's just a bow tie or first thrust or other emerging trend pattern on an efficient stock. The reason it's on an efficient stock is that an efficient stock is everything is priced in. So if you see an airline and it's kind of way up here at a high level, everything's kind of priced into that airline, okay? And then you begin to see that short set up. It might be worth a shot. Uh, a one-dimensional company, okay, meaning that you don't want to short a company that, that well, first of all, that, that you want to make sure they're not splitting the atom. We'll get to that. I'm getting a little far ahead of myself. But you want to make sure it's kind of a one-dimensional company, like United Airlines or these other airlines. They're not doing a whole bunch of different things. They're not like a conglomerate. They're kind of like doing just one thing. And when that one thing is no longer working, then they will tend to fall from grace. And that makes a little bit more sense with like a, a restaurant, a food company, or like a coffee bean roaster, which we'll get to. Um, if they are a big thick stock, meaning higher in volume, well traded, they're going to be overanalyzed and over scrutinized. I'd love to know how many analysts they are for a company like UAL. Probably quite a few people are just picking this stock apart, okay? And it seems like the more people you have picking it apart, when they begin to crack, the worse they they do. And I, I guess there's people out there can only can only recommend to buy a stock, never recommend to sell. So when they're wrong, a lot of people get sucked in. Um, quantifiable fundamentals. Again, like I said earlier, you know what the airline costs, you know what the fuel costs, you know what the labor costs. You could crunch a bunch of numbers and know what they're actually making. I'd be off by a little bit, but have a pretty good idea what a valuation for that stock could be. Conversely, let's say you've got a little IPO. We were long a little IPO trill, which started to look pretty good again, by the way. TRIL, not that long ago. And just for SGs, I looked up the fundamentals on it, and I noticed that they lost $2.92 a share, and that's based on like a $15 stock price so it's like wait a minute these this stocks only at 50 bucks they lost three dollars a share last year so it's not much to quantify not much to hang your high hat on there but if you had if you had assets and earnings and all these other things and things of that nature then you could put some kind of valuation on i'm not saying it's a fundamental system but in this particular system you want to have some sort of quantifiable fundamentals before you look at a short the stock, okay? Now, again, kind of along the lines of one-dimensional, make sure they're not splitting the atom, okay? And as I said, I think when I wrote about the thing, they're splitting the bean or they're splitting the bean burrito. They're not splitting the atom. Chipotle was a great short a while back. I was on an a institutional project, and um, I came out looking like a genius because that's the short I recommended, and, and the stock just halved over a short period of time. I think Green Mountain was right about the same time or somewhere in that um, maybe it was a little bit before but it's another big one i remember it's like well they split the bean right it's so what a coffee roaster not the atom now the other thing to think about easy barrier to entry or a competitive field airlines are just brutally competitive it's not easy to open up an airline overnight but somebody could buy an airline technically and be in the airline business pretty quickly um, but easy barrier to entry, uh, restaurants, for instance, not that hard of a barrier to get into. So competition could arise really quick. Uh, fad stocks like a, like a coffee stock, like Green Mountain or something like that, it would the fad wears off. Uh, you know, I think we all ran out and bought the little cup making the look, oh, this would be great to make coffee, whatever I want. And, well, that's not a big enough cup of coffee or Geez, it's sure is expensive. I could buy a powder, even though coffee is expensive, and that little convenient cup, well, it really costs a fortune. Is it really worth it? It, it? I think that's probably why Green Mountain tanked a while back. So a fad can help these stocks. But the main thing is, first and foremost, you always want to look at pattern first and foremost before you interject too much of these qualifications. Okay? Shaq. Yeah, Shaq might be the next one to implode. Uh, Karen, uh, I hear you on that one. Okay, any questions or thoughts or comments on shorty or anything I've mentioned so far before we um, 
I'll take a little look at the portfolio. Yeah, KKD. Perfect. Perfect, Phil. Thank you. Phil's always has something good to contribute. Uh, Krispy Kreme, okay? It's they, What are they doing? They're making donuts, okay? They're making donuts. Anybody can make donuts, right? It's not that hard. But it was kind of like a fad. Everybody got excited about Krispy Kreme donuts, KKD, okay? But then what happens? Well, eventually the reality sets in. All right, Fritchie says, GMCR take because of the false accounting practices. Okay, well, so what? It doesn't matter why they tanked. They tanked, okay? But I hear you. And it seems like and that's where – so that's where I would go back to my technical argument, okay? Well, why is UAL taken? Well, UAL is taken because, I don't know, there was some bad news about the airlines yesterday. It might not have anything to do with with some of these efficiency things I'm talking about, but that all helps, okay? So it all sort of helps to exacerbate the slide. I know it's supposed to be a PG-13 show, right? <laughs> but, yeah, good point, French. Yeah, I hear you. But don't confuse the issue with facts. If it's gone down, it's gone down. And those are the kind of things that can really help in. Let me let me figure out figure a way figure out a way to kind of spin that, uh, Frenchie. Well, the spin on that is well, okay, the everything is sort of priced in, okay, and then if there's an accounting, just a slight little error in the accounting, then that gets and there's that word again exacerbated, and then all of a sudden the stock really implodes, okay. So you've got all these things that are in there that, that sort of keep a stock priced for perfection. These efficient stocks at high levels, these single-dimensional companies, these fad companies that keep them at these high levels. And as soon as there's a little bit of a chink in the armor, then the stock gets into a lot of trouble really quickly. But good point. All right, let's look at the portfolio. Just a couple of things I was looking at this morning when I was pulling this up and studying it. Um, 10 out of 11 open winners. Which is great, okay? Don't get me wrong. And then this one could maybe – we could even have 11 out of 11 open windows, winners. But I would much rather see – not that I want to be less correct, but I would much rather see the second loaf here, second half of the position, much bigger, and have – instead of like a, a 2887 gain, I'd like to see a 28,000, okay, 87, whatever, gain in the second loaf. Because that's where your real money is. Remember, and I don't want to go into too many details because we covered it. We covered this ad nauseum. We're risking 2% on a position if stopped out. We're looking to make 1% on the first loaf, on the first half of the position. So we've got 1,000 shares. We divide that by 2. And we're going to trade 500. And we're going to keep 500 for hopefully a longer term trade. And we're going to use a trailing stop to keep us in. Okay, 500 shares. So depending on the price of the stock and the volatility of the stock, well, more importantly, the volatility of the stock, the amount of shares is going to make a big difference. Like it's something like this, a lower price stock. Notice that you're buying 2,500 shares, okay? And then notice like that UAL we just talked about, you're only buying a couple hundred shares because your stop, STOP, is much bigger in this higher price stock. And then the volatility factors in too. But the point is, we're only looking to make about a thousand bucks on the first loaf. Every night that you get lucky in the market gaps, you make a little bit more like this. But as a general statement, thousand dollars, thousand dollars, thousand dollars. This one hasn't hit the initial profit target yet. Here's another thousand dollars. And then what you want to do in an ideal world is you want to make some big multiple thereof on the second loaf. There's two videos out there. They may be hard to find, but they're out there on YouTube where I discuss the um, how the money management doesn't have a negative expectancy because the one for one on the first loaf gets everybody a little nervous because you're risking five bucks to make five bucks. Oh, but Dave, I read that you're supposed to risk, you're supposed to make three times what you risk. Well, yeah, but that gets a little complicated because if, if you do put those um, parameters into place, you're three times more likely to get stopped out statistically than to make that three times profit. Okay, I don't want to get into too many details right now. 
but go in and watch those two videos. If you can't find them out, I'm, I'm going to have to dig them out, but they're somewhere on YouTube. And I've only had 1,300 videos, 1,301 videos, so it shouldn't take you that long just to watch them all and, and find them, right? <laughs> so the point is the real money is in the second loaf, and you want to make many multiples there. The other thing that I can't drive the point home enough is that you want to have a, li have a limited risk. In this case, $2,000 is on a 100K account, 2%, okay, which is $2,000. You want to have a limited loss, barring overnight gaps, but in general, a limited loss of $2,000 every time you go into position. And then you want to have a potential for unlimited gains. Like in this case, round numbers, that's $3,000 plus $1,000, so that's $4,000. So you made twice as much so far as you put up. And then, again, like I just said, I'd rather this be $28,000. So then you made, what, 14 times, so put a one in front of that, 14 times what you put up. And then that's where the real money is. So I'm very proud that, we're being, that we have been very accurate lately and, and nailed a bunch of winners. I've got a bunch of winners. But I'd much rather have a few of these be much bigger and not worry so much about the accuracy, okay? Um, you could be wrong most of the time as long as you are right big here and there. A lot of times this number will be something like 20000 down here, but you'll have a $15,000 position and maybe a $4,000 position, and then the rest of everything else will be mixed. And then you know, that's, this is when people will quit. I'm like, quit? Why'd you quit? We're printing money. We don't always print money, but in this particular case, in time, yeah, we're printing money. Well, well uh, I can't make any money. Well, how can you not make money? Well, did you get this one? And, and are you up fifteen thousand? No, I didn't get that one. Did you get this one? Are you up four thousand? No, I didn't get that one. But every other stinker, or everyone that is a stinker, I should say, they picked up. Well, that's just the way trading momentum works, and you have to wrap your head around that. It's not a perfect methodology, and no methodology is perfect. Oh, any okay? Uh, any questions on anything we talked about so far? I'm gonna kind of getting anxious to jump out to the charts. A couple of announcements and then we'll pop up to the charts. Um, if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks right now, that's fine. And then we'll, uh, I want to sh take a look at the overall market, take a look at some sector action, and then we'll jump into the, um, I'll answer your questions, the individual, individual stocks. Any uh, any stock, any questions on anything covered so far? Okay, quiet bunch today. A couple of announcements. Um, if you go to my website and click on products, or if you go to this direct link, you get to the store. And on Tuesday night, when we get back from our Labor Day celebrations, and I'm sorry, Memorial Day, we'll get through uh, remembering the people who, uh, who died for this wonderful and great country we live in. It's still a great country. I don't care what anyone says. When we get through doing that, um, I will be doing a stock selection webinar. It's going to be Tuesday. I think that's the 26th. Let me uh, check my calendar here. 26, yeah. Tuesday the 26th. And it's at um, Severn. Seven, Severn? I sound like, uh, what's her name? What's his name? Um, Modia? Modia? <laughs> Severn. Seven o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. And just go to Intro Stock Selection Webinar. And if you can't remember all that, just look at the countdown on my website and sign up. The webinar is free. It's right here. Pick the best and leave the rest. So just click on this little thing here, and you'll be able to sign up for that. Now, I am going to give you a valuable promo code. Ooh, what a tease in that uh, webinar. So if you want the full-blown course, you will get a lot. Uh, for those of you who know me, for those of you who don't know me, I should say, when I do, uh, when, anytime I do these, uh, if you want to call them a teaser webinar or whatever, usually I give out a lot of good information, or I always give out a lot of good information. I know your time is valuable, and I want to make sure I teach as much as possible within the allotted time. And then I'm not too worried about giving away everything because the course is 14 hours. What can I do in one hour? I can get a lot in in one hour, but I can't get everything in because the whole thing took me 14 hours to do. Anyway, um, 
I'm going to start a sale tomorrow. Okay. So write down these promo codes, the IPO course, $150 off. TIPO to be all lowercase. Put that promo code in. It's not going to be active until tomorrow, though, or Friday, the 22nd. Okay. Um, how much off the stock selection course? Well, if you come to the webinar, I'm going to give you a promo code, and it's going to be substantial to make it worth your while. I promise. Uh, $200 off a yearly service. You want to go that route? Core 200 is going to be your promo code for that. Again, not until tomorrow. Dave Landry's swing trading, seven bucks. Use the promo code 10 off. Dave Landry's 10 best, 17. Use the promo code 10B for best patterns off. Okay, 10B off. So there are your promo codes. Write them down. And starting tomorrow, you'll be able to use those codes. Okay. Trade me. Dave, like your education, but I can't read Western bar charts. I use candlesticks. Well, you need to learn how to read Western charts. Candlesticks is a fad. <laughs> I mean, it's only been around a couple thousand years. It's it's probably going away. Uh, I used candles early on, and I like the I like the way that they kind of were nice and big and fat. Just make your uh, make your Western bars fatter. That's all you got to do. Um. But I used candles, and I went through that fad. Uh, and, and I do like the way they, they show up better on a chart. Sometimes if I open up like a Forex program or something, and it's got a candle chart on it, I'll, I'll leave it on. I won't uh, I won't bother around to figure out how to change back to Western chart. Uh, but you should you should be able to learn. You should be able to do both. I have clients that use candles, and I like to pick on the candle people and some of my good friends are, are candle people and actually have written books on candles. So, but they'll tell you flat out too. It's like not everything is a pattern and not everything is a major reversal. And also it's kind of like, well, what are you reversing? Because a lot of times I'll see uh, just a, a sideways trading range and there'll be a candle pattern in it. And then somebody will be like, Oh, it's three babies in a, and a naked lady running down the road or whatever, I don't know, with our baby to poopy diaper. You know, what are these candle patterns? Three birds crapping on a wire. It's like, well, okay, well, that's an ominous trend reversal signal. It's like, okay, well, what do you reverse if the market is just going sideways? So it's not always a pattern. And the other problem that I have with the candle people is you get one bad bar, which like in the Western chart, be like an outside day down, which is like, oh, it's an outside day down. Not a good thing, but not necessarily into the world. But you get one bad day down, you know, it's a sumo wrestler eating, uh, fried chicken or whatever the pattern may be and then all of a sudden it's the end of the trend end of the world well start trading that and you're gonna get your butt handed to you more often than not because as a general statement surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend as a general statement an established trend usually continues okay so just tread lightly if you're going to use the uh, candle patterns Okay, uh, good questions coming in on individual stocks. Let's uh, take a look at the overall market. Um, I'm going to switch back to a black chart. I like the black charts better. Okay, Phil says, new candle pattern. Man strips naked at Charlotte Airport. No, it's a real news story, yeah. <laughs> a man stripping at the airport. That's what. I, that's the pattern I use with the, uh, with the UAL. Okay, we'll, get to, we'll take a look at that, James. Uh, good, uh, a lot of stock questions coming in. Yeah, let me just get an update real quick, and then we'll, um, we'll get into these charts. Should MNGA break two dollars before you start following closely? You know, more. You, I don't know if you, you're asking from a price standpoint or not. I'm, I'm just kind of filibusting while I'm waiting for the charts to load. Uh, but in more recent years, I've been more inclined to trade lower price stocks. Just seems like after we had that bear market in 2007, 2008, a lot of stocks got beaten up to a point where even those at um, lower price stocks, lower levels, were worth trading. Uh, a few years ago, and, and now especially, even now, it's like uh, the, the the rare earth stocks. They got beaten up so much. They just had wonderful trends a few years ago. Then they got beaten up so bad that the only ones um, left to trade are at super low levels. So I'm not – I used to say let's just trade stocks $10, $15 a share or more. 
but I'm not as worried about that anymore. I think if you're trading for point gains and uh, your short, short term trading or day trading, maybe you're better off trading those uh, higher price stocks and all. But we'll get to that, Gary. We'll take a look at that. Okay. This update's taking a little longer than I thought. Waiting for pizza, wasting your life. Waiting for charts, wasting your life. Come on, you could do it. All right, here we go. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look at the overall market first, and then I want to um, drill down into a couple sectors and also talk about a couple little areas in here. All right, here we go. Okay, first of all, let's take a look at the P's. I think I messed up my charts earlier today. All right, there you are. Okay, the good news is if they stay where they are now, they will close at all-time highs. Let's take a look at the spiders. And then just yesterday in the spiders, you had a, a – what was the pattern here? A, a, a baby running around naked? Um, I wouldn't even know how to make a candle in these charts. By the way, you got to use the spiders if you are going to use a candle. Oh, here we go. Yeah, see, just yesterday you had you had a baby eating two chocolate cream pies, okay? So that's a, that's a bearish pattern, right? No, seriously. Um, don't get caught up in a day to day too much because if the market is near new highs in general, you want to err on the side of the longer term trend. So we're right here at all time closing highs. If the market sticks, I know it's a big if, but stranger things could happen. Um, as a general statement, I need to check with my buddy, Rob Hanna over at uh, quantifiable edges, but as a general statement, my experience has been holiday weeks, especially if I'm short the market, <laughs> but uh, not that I'm short the market this week, but any week I'm short the market uh, and it's a holiday week, the market tends to go up. And I guess people are feeling good about a day off or whatever, or they get their buying done early, then they, they uh, take off for the rest of the week. But as the P's are now, we're at all-time highs, so don't fight it. Now, as I was saying earlier, I just wrote an article for Proactive Magazine. I'll put the uh, – you can email me for the link or I'll put it up on the website – one thing that's kind of fascinating is everything works better with trend, like I say, quite often. And since like 2012 in here, you could see that we've only had a few days of daylight below the moving average. The daylight has been to the upside. Notice that these lows, you could draw a trend line between the lows and the moving average. There's been a gap between the moving average and the daylight. Some people call that a moving average window. I think that's what the Japanese call it. Okay. And you only had a few days below the moving average here. Now, we did have sell signals back here. We had a bow tie sell signal. Doesn't mean that you should rush out and trade this trading system, okay? But as a general statement, as long as you have daylight above the moving average, you want to continue to err on the side of the longer-term trend. And you could experiment with any moving averages you want, okay? The beauty of using the concept of daylight is there's no lag because – price can move quickly above and below the moving average. So it's kind of fascinating that this last little run or last time we had um, a significant amount of downside daylight, markets ran up about 60% or so. And if you go a little further back, it's 70, 80%. You can see a lot of daylight back here. So it's a good little uh, thing to look at. Everything works better with trend though. Like I'll see a trend like this. And, and, and somebody will show you a system with a thousand buys and sells throughout this trend. And I'll be like, well, why don't you just buy here when you had daylight and get out and then get back in when you had daylight? Daylight again. You know, one or two buys or sells would have kept you in that whole trend. So never forget that everything works better with trend. And then in the end, a simple, a simple system works best. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. 
If the NASDAQ closes here, it won't quite be at all-time highs, but it's just going to be a Nats eyelash below them. So it's very, very close to all-time highs. So that's looking pretty interesting, too. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty's a bit of a bummer. It's kind of like clawing its way higher, but it's having a hard time getting there. Um, it doesn't look fantastic. Let's put it in a bow tie here. Now, we did bow tie down a little while ago, but as long as the smart can hold these levels of higher, moving averages have begun to cross back over. So technically, it's really not a, a bow tie anymore. I guess it's I guess it's not completely negated unless this market uh, makes new highs and everything crosses back over. But I wouldn't rush out and short it. But I am a little concerned that it's uh, having a hard time getting back up to its old highs. Now, the good thing is if it does begin to sell off, there's a lot of support below the market here. But the Rusty's kind of been all over the place. So that scores a bit of a bummer. Now, here's something, speaking of a bummer, um, bonds, as you know, have been in a pretty serious slide for quite a while. And we did have a bow tie down back here. Okay. So that suggests that's the major top. Let's go back to that Rusty for one second. So this bow tie here suggests that this is a top. But if this top gets taken out, then it was merely a suggestion, okay? So as long as it holds, the top remains in place. You see what I'm saying there? So you got a bow tie down here. It's a little sloppy. But it, as long as it doesn't take that out, that remains your top. And then that'll probably be, that might be the top forever. Uh, write that down, okay? Dave says it might be the top forever in bonds. Now, you younger people don't come back 50 years from now <laughs> and say, hey, Dave, you were wrong. <laughs> it went to new highs. But that might be the top in bonds forever. Who knows? Never say never when it comes to markets, okay? There were people that said that the NASDAQ would never hit new highs. And they were right for 15 years. So that's that's a pretty long time to be right. Um, I'm still the bull on these energies and some of these emerging trends from low levels. Notice energies came in here, bottomed out a little bit making bottoms off of multi-year lows. You can got to go back, uh, what, several years before we were this low in the energies. They just looked abysmal for a while, but now they're coming back, looking pretty good. Uh, we're long, uh, what are we long, TGA in the energies and uh, USO, the commodity itself. In fact, let's take a look at the commodity itself, okay? Um, when you trade an inefficient market, as I suggested earlier, you sort of want to be trading it off the fringes. I'm sorry, an efficient market. I get the two confused. But when you trade an efficient market like oil, okay, you got producers, suppliers, consumers, retail. It's like all these people are kind of fighting it out for the prices. Okay, so it's hard for it to make a big quantum jump one way or the other, but it's possible. But when you're down here at multi-year lows like we were here, let's look at a weekly uh, pretty serious lows. Yeah, you can go a long ways back in this particular contract, at least. Let's take a look at a monthly chart, maybe. Yeah, life of contract lows for this contract, okay? Now, I know we probably had lower oil back before 2007, but this is all we have to go off of for this ETF, okay? A lot of overhead supply, but that's, what, a double from here? So if I make 100% on this trade, I'm not going to complain, okay? That'd be a good problem to have. But you can see so far, rallying nicely from the lows. Let's put the bow ties in. You got a bow tie off of somewhat of a double bottom, off of all-time lows for the contract, uh, significant lows for oil itself. So, so far, it looks like a bottom's in place. Correcting a little bit in here, but eh, it happens. A correction is a great thing and a healthy thing and a good thing, provided, of course, it doesn't take you out in the process. So if you're trailing that stop higher, you don't get stopped out. Correction comes and goes. That's a good thing. can clear the way for the market to trade higher. So that's what's going on in oil bonds. Let's take a look at the dollar. Now, you gotta be careful with your intermarket technical analysis. And every now and then I'll dust off my Murphy's book, my book on intermarket technical analysis. And uh, it's called Intermarket Technical Analysis or something like that. It's by John Murphy. Yeah, here it is right here, Intermarket Technical Analysis. Do read the book. You can, you can find it on my website. Uh, go to Amazon. It's pretty cheap. And you could, uh, I think I'll make 35 cents if you buy a copy. So I appreciate that if you buy it through me or just use the search function on my website and that'll, um, that'll give me 35 cents. 
I'll be happy to toss that in a plate maybe on Sunday. Uh, but do read the book, but realize, as Murphy even says, it's long lead and lag cycle. So don't try to rush out and buy stocks or bonds or whatever the case may be or metals based on what you're seeing in some other market. Those correlations or inverse correlations, depending on how you want to look at them, only matter when they matter. But do learn about them and do understand them, okay? So what happens when the dollar begins to slide? Well, commodities are dollar denominated. Now, some people will talk about, well, if they ever switched over to euro, we'd be screwed. Or, I mean, who knows? Okay, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. But if the dollar goes down and commodities are based in dollars, it's going to take more dollars to buy the commodity. Okay, stay with me. So the commodity price as a general statement will go higher. So there's definitely an inverse correlation. Let's say the dollar goes up. Well, dollar stronger, you could buy more commodities if commodities are dollar denominated. Now, it's a complex world. Things don't always work on a one-for-one -one basis. But you do and you should and you need to learn these relationships. But also, but you have to realize they only matter when they matter. Many years ago, bonds and stocks had a beautiful inverse correlation. You could buy one market, sell the other one. You could do spreads all day long and make a lot of money. That only works now when it works. So far, stock market in general has been ignoring the slide in bonds. That won't always be the case. So do learn these intermarket technical analysis things, especially with like with bonds, because as rates begin to go up, it's going to put more pressure on stocks. So you do have the bow tie. It took a little while to form in the dollar, but you do have a bow tie nonetheless. So until proven otherwise, this is the all-time – I'm using the word all-time too much today. You know markets. They can do whatever they want. But this is the top in the dollar for now. And we've had a little retrace in here lately, which is fine. But so far, it looks like dollars topped. Bonds are headed lower. Stocks are kind of hanging in there. Now, as far as the sectors – a lot of stocks, as you would imagine, there's only a few more to go through, so we'll get to your stock picks, so keep them coming. As you would imagine, a lot of stocks are sideways like the market itself, and at or near, not too far from new highs. Here's a semis, not too far from new highs, so that's a good thing. Drugs yesterday banged out new highs, and then today it looks like they're still at new highs, so so far, so good there. I'm still a little bit more excited about trading something like the energies at lower levels, and then some of these metals and mining stocks like steel and iron and copper are at least being long in those areas. Right now they're retracing, so we might not buy any more. But I'm a little bit more excited about being long something like this at lower levels at this juncture than rushing out and buying some drugs and biotech. Now, when you see a chance, you take it. So if we start seeing some setups, some new setups in these areas, then we'll certainly take it. And if you look at the portfolio, we certainly have a lot going on in uh, a lot of these areas that are in longer term uptrends that we established those positions over the past uh, months or so. Again, uh, retail uh, had been kind of uh, sideways in here or still is pretty much sideways. Saw it off a little bit yesterday, but now it's beginning to bounce a little bit. So as a general statement, most areas are hanging in there. Uh, a couple exceptions, obviously, the uh, airlines and then the transports got whacked fairly hard, obviously, yesterday. But they're finding a little support today towards the bottom of their range. So we do need to keep an eye on transports. If they begin to break down in earnest, what do you have? You have a tremendous amount of overhead supply here. So all is it great in the world, but as long as the market can hang in there, we are going to continue to err on the side of the trend. We might fire off a short here and there. Can't guarantee you won't fire off a short here and there, but for the most part, we're going to stick. We're going to dance with the one that brung you, I guess. We're going to stay on the long side for now. All right. Let's open it up for individual stocks. SWN for James. SWN looks fantastic. Okay, that's a low-level um, energy stock. Um, only problem, I guess, the uh, reason that it's not a setup, or I don't, I'm not showing it as a setup, is um, it has a little bit too many days in the pullback. Okay, and then once it start picking it apart, it doesn't look as great. If you're long, stay long. But you do have a bow tie off of all times lows. Your bow tie would have triggered somewhere in here. And you can see we've kind of retraced back. So at first glance, it looks fantastic. Once we begin to pick it apart a little bit, from this pullback, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then this will be seven. Depends on what happens today, obviously. 
seven days of that pullback. As a general statement, I like stocks at low levels. Just kind of trigger and not look back. I think this SID comes to mind. Let's see if I if I could get it to come up. Uh, yeah, SID's a good example of that. Just pulls back a few days and then it triggers and it doesn't look back. Okay. And was that? I don't know if that was a bow tie to close enough for government work. Kind of a first thrust, kind of a couple hand, couple cup and handle looking. Okay. So it did pull back three days, but that's only three days. It pulled back a couple of days and then take off with these transitional patterns. Whereas, like right now, I wouldn't rush out and buy this as a new setup, but we're hanging on by the skin of our teeth to see if we can survive this correction it takes off again. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve days of this pullback, and it's still sort of an emerging trend. So you have to wonder whether or not the trend is really continuing to materialize. Well, Dave, why would you still be long? Well, because we're not stopped out. The market has to prove us wrong. We can think all we want, but the market is the final arbiter. I've said that before, but you might want to write that down. The market is the final arbiter. All right, Wynn wants to short LL. LL. Uh, no, too late on that one. Um, they got in a lot of trouble for something, huh? Some cheap wood or something. 60 Minutes or something came after them. Um, here's a deal. This stock's in a lot of trouble, and it's been in a lot of trouble for a long, long time. And then I don't know when the bad news came out, but you could see that it did have a big gap down in here. So maybe that's right about the time that the bad news came out. It looks like, in this particular case, it looks like it's already done, okay? It's pretty much made a round trip from here all the way to here. So it's a little late to short. It's also not um, set up, okay? It's just breaking down. It's not a setup. And it's also kind of crazy and all over the place. So you don't want to mess with that. You want to leave that alone. If you take a look at something like UAL, now, granted, it doesn't look as great now as it did when we first saw it back here. But you can see that it had that, like, cup and handle pattern. And it was just beginning to break down and pull back a little bit. Love, like somebody pointed out, thank you um, for that. You had the you had the bow tie off of all time highs. Okay, when you get a bow tie, you look back to the high, and that's the top until proven proven otherwise. So write that down too. A lot of write that down moments today, right? And you can see it's it wasn't a route lower, but it did begin to come unglued. So you want to try to find those areas, especially on the short side, especially in a bull market like we're in. If you are going to short, you want to find those stocks that are still at those high levels that are beginning to roll over and crack. Now, just be careful, though, with something like biotech. And if you do short a biotech, make sure it's such a big biotech that one little drug is not going to make all the difference in the world to the company, okay? Okay. You certainly don't want to short a little one-dimensional company that's a biotech. You, you, it's okay to short a one-dimensional company that's some sort of big established in, industry or a restaurant or a coffee bean company or whatever we talked about earlier. But be darn careful if you're shorting a little biotech company that's kind of like a one-trick pony. Because, yeah, it, it, you could make a lot of money if their one-trick pony doesn't work, if their one-trick pony dies – but if uh, that product turns into a uh, stallion, then you could be in a lot of trouble really quick. So, yeah, too uh, too long. Uh, Celgene may be a short, according to Phil. Let's see. Phil likes that 50-day moving average, which um, I have no problem with. Uh, and so I, I'm guessing he's saying it's probably, knowing Phil, it's probably retraced back to its 50. So let's add in a 50-day moving average. It's a 200. 50. Let's put the 50 in there. Okay. Phil's a big fan of uh, letting the market break below the 200. Uh, sorry, the 50-day moving average. They look to short them as they retrace back to it. Nothing wrong with that. That's kind of a neat little pattern to trade. 
Uh, yeah, I think you're right, Phil. I think the stock's in trouble, but I, I know we're, we 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 agree in principle and methodology, your methodology. But it does have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's got about thirteen days in this last little pullback. For me to like a stock, if a stock's going to crack, it should crack within a few days. Just like now, when it comes to these emerging trends, it should crack within a few days, or it should take off within a few days, like we just looked at that SID. So I'm a bigger fan of that. But I hear you, bigger picture wise, the stock is beginning to kind of uh, meander around its 50-day moving average, and the next leg could be lower. But yeah, it's not a not a short for me. But yeah, it is a big. Look at this. Uh, add two zeros to that. It's 56 million. Or five million, six million. It's a lot. It's a lot of shares are traded daily. Okay, Gary says, should MNGA, MN, MGA, should MNGA break two dollars before you would start following closely to maybe buy? Well, one problem that I have. Well, first of all, this one's kind of all over the place. And let's look at the HV on this one. The HV is 140. Not that I've never traded a stock with an HV that high, but as a general statement, it's probably too dangerous. Once they get over 100 and something in the 50-day HV, if you don't have the formula, I'll give it to you. Um, it's much simpler for something like Meta stock, which I do have, than it is for um, Telechart, but once you put the formula in, it's just a cut and paste. It doesn't matter. But, yeah, it's about 50 lines long for Telechart. But, anyway, the other thing, too, and this is one thing I talked about in the stock selection course, is I call it a bottle rocket. It went from 60 to 150, so that's roughly, what, 300% roughly round numbers over a very short period of time. So, in addition to this crazy HV, the fact that it went straight up 300% over a few days, or a few weeks, I guess, in this case, it's just too crazy to trade. And a lot of times, the reason I call it bottle rockets is, to those of you who don't uh, live in the Redneck portion, in the Redneck Riviera, Redneck Riviera like I do, and have no experience with fireworks, the bottle rocket is a little uh, firework that you put in the bottle, hence the name bottle rocket, and you light it. And when they take off, they're like, Psh! you know, it's like, wow, let's well, stand back. And um, But they quickly, like, fizzle out. And they pop and oh okay well, that wasn't so great. Let's let's put a let's put a gross of them in there and light them all at once. Then then you got something. But I digress. The point being that when stocks take off like this, I call them a bottle rocket. They go up three hundred percent, and a lot of times they'll come back down three hundred percent. So I would avoid this stock. I wouldn't even I wouldn't care if it got above two or anything. Okay. Baba bow tied up. Yeah, I was looking at Baba. Now, it's a little wide and loose and crazy. And when you get a gap bow tie like this, um, I call it a forced bow tie, but I hear you. And one of the newer IPO patterns I've been watching is uh, everything I do is kind of a variation on what I've already done for the most part. Like the GoGo Nomo, it's kind of a variation on using bow ties and first thrust and reversal cap strategies and all those other strategies that I talked about in uh, 10 best okay and it's just kind of a variation on like picking a certain stock within there now the phoenix strategy is like uh when you have these stocks that go down and bottom forever for years and years and months and months hopefully years and years and then begin to take off again they begin the company begins to reinvent themselves or in the case of like the energies the energy sector overall begins to bottom out the commodity begins to rally so that's what i call the phoenix stock because they begin to rise from the ashes so in the IPOs, one thing I've noticed in more recent times is what I call the the IPO Phoenix strategy, is where you let us let an IPO bottom out, okay, and then they begin to rally. There, there's a couple of energy IPOs that that have done this. They escape me at the moment, um, but it's like they brought an energy company public right in the middle of an energy bear market. So it's like they just their their timing just sucked okay it happens right so what happens is the stock goes down forever but then it bottoms out and it's actually still a good company okay so when you begin to get that cup and handle that setup or whatever it's worth a shot because the energy stocks are doing what going up so it's kind of like the, what i call a phoenix ipo um baba is just most overhyped craziest stupidest ipo ever 
but now that it's kind of bottomed out in here, anyone who uh, bought it too early or anybody was off the hook, who needs to get off the hook, on the hook, I should say, VC, venture capitalists, people like that, bankers, whoever, underwriters, they're probably washed out the system by now. So now actually might be a time to start considering uh, something like BABA, maybe on a pullback, okay? But I will, I'll say that this, this is more what I would call reversal gap strategy. And your buy would be somewhere in here. The only thing I don't, not cr completely crazy about is that you do have this big gap down and you do have some overhead supply in here. Let me see if I could find you. FMSA comes to mind. This is one that I talked about in the, um, in the little teaser webinar I did recently about an IPO, kind of a Phoenix thing. Notice the company comes public and it makes its all-time high within the first day of trading. And here's a little trick for you. And I'll do a, an IPO webinar again soon. But uh, go in and watch the, the IPO webinar on my website. Under, um, I'll show you where it is. And if you don't learn anything from the webinar, if you just learn, I, sh I should say, if you only have one little takeaway, just know that many times the high or low is set in the first week of trading with an IPO. So if you scroll down, you go to IPOs on here. It's uh, daylander.com slash trade IPOs. Go down to the video, which is somewhere in here, right here. And then watch this video, and in here you're going to see that I talk about the fact that many times a significant higher low is made in that first week of trading. So notice this FMSA, if you wanted to buy this stock and say, well, let's just wait a week and see what happens, you would have avoided a really crappy trade. Okay, It lost about, uh, I'm just kind of eyeballing it, 60%, 70%, 80% of its value. But now it's sort of begun to reinvent itself. It made a bow tie here, kind of bottomed out. Okay, uh, what's going on with the metals and mining? They're kind of bottoming out or they have bottomed out. And then it has to take it off just yet, but you can see it looks pretty good. So you can apply that Phoenix strategy and those emerging trend strategies. And sometimes they lend themselves really well to something like an IPO. Or in this particular case, I'll call it a toddler, a recent or fairly recent IPO. So yeah, good eye on the BABA. BABA's already owned by 1,300 funds. Yeah, it's just so thick and so big, and everybody that brother is going to own it, and, and and as soon as somebody needs some money, it's like they're going to dump it. So it's just kind of a pain. Uh, SGYP as a long? No. No, I don't think so. Um, no, first of all, it's all over the place. It's kind of wide and loose. And then in more recent times, it just kind of went way down, and now you've got a little bit of a gap here. Um, it's kind of all over the place. So. Maybe if it got its act together, got above five dollars a share and on a pullback, maybe. But um, yeah, when I'm just not a big fan of that. DSKX for Mr. James. Thanks for waiting so patiently. Um, is this a new company that was an old company or a new symbol? Uh, I like the way that's headed higher. Maybe on a maybe just a tiny bit more pullback. It is a little bit on the thin side. Because it's only about uh, 200,000 shares a day, and it is only two bucks a share, but it's not bad, okay? Maybe on just a tiny bit more of a pullback, but not too much, because you don't want it to come too much into this prior little uh, area here. I would definitely put this on your watch list and watch it for maybe just a little bit more of a knockout. But yeah, good eye on that one, James. High five to you. Notice I give a little bit more, a few more high fives to people on the service. Well, because I beat you guys up for uh, – if you give me bad stocks, I beat you up. Now, I don't know if this is an old symbol, new symbol problem, but I do see a lot of overhead supply with this stock in here. Um, so that's the only problem. But shorter term, I hear you. I mean, shorter term, the stock has gotten its act together. Nice little persistent move higher. Nice little pullback here. So if you're long, stay long. If you're not, wait for the next pullback. The only thing I would caution is, is this – a different company back here if this is the same company because a lot of people, even if it before, long before it gets way up here, will be looking to bail out. So when I see a, 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 a company that looks like this, I double check it to make sure that this is not an old stock in here, that the symbol got uh, reused and that's old data. But it looks like it's uh, legit. 
All right. Ciao, Marco. Ciao. Grazie. Uh, I need to work on some airplanes. Yeah, Marco. Marco keeps those airplanes in the air. Thank you, Marco. We appreciate that. ADXS. Um, as a short, I think this uh, stock's in trouble. I'd be careful though, because it's 80, because it's a diagnostic substance. It's also 92. Be a little dangerous to short, but I think it's in trouble. It's kind of retracing up. Too many days though in this retrace higher. Uh, if you're long, stay long, but have a stop in place. Have a chair ready for when the music stops. Okay, I'd be careful on that one, Steve. HABT sympathy with Shaq. HABT. Yeah, I've been watching this HABT. And it's a little wide and loose and a little squirrely. But it did kind of do that uh, to some extent, did that kind of Phoenix thing I talked about. It kind of kind of um, shot higher, but then it came in here, bottomed out, took off, pulled back. This has been in my watch list for a few days. It's a little too wide and loose, but sometimes you could be a little bit more lenient when it comes to these IPOs, okay? Shaq, yeah, Shaq is just uh, taking off nicely. This was actually in our buy list a while back, but it – um. It gapped higher, and, of course, it took off anyway. Eh, you can't kiss all the women, but uh, it does look interesting, maybe on a pullback. But it is a one-dimensional company. I think this, I was talking about – is that Shake Shack? We talked about those burgers last week. My God, amazing. Andre wants to know about LLNW. LLNW. Yeah, on a pullback. I mean, it's trending. I think I've got it in my momentum list. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, on a pullback. Okay, we did that one. Uh, UWN, kind of enlightening round now. Uh, uh, too thin. Too thin. Way, 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 way thin. So I'd be careful with that. Uh, for IPOs, we're a little bit more lenient. Also, it's kind of just has this one or two big, big, big bars higher. Kind of a micro version of that uh, uh, bottle rocket thing. So I would avoid that. A, B, C, D. Are you joking? No, he's not. <laughs> oh, look how cute. They're an educational company. One of my problems with these educational companies is that uh, the sector is just a choppy, choppy, choppy sector. Super, super thin. Uh, also, once again, you just got a couple of big updates, and that's it in this last little breakout. So I would leave that one alone. ELNK. That's still company still around? That's Earthlink. Oh, look at that. Yeah, on a pullback. Um, you can see it's losing some steam. Notice that it kind of shot higher, and now it's kind of in this drift mode here. Ideally, you want to see a company do this and then this, okay? You don't want to see them do this and then and then this, okay? Kind of drift off. I mean, it's kind of hard to see, but you. But it, let's see if we measure it to here and to here. You can see it certainly lost some of that steam, but on a pullback, it might be worthwhile. You got a pretty good base it's launched off of. So, yeah, on a pullback, maybe. R E L Y. E L Y. Yeah, I know this is another bottle rocket, okay? It's just kind of going straight up in here. Now, this was an actual buy right here as an IPO. So, if you're long, right there, stay long, but. Wait for a bit of a pullback. A little bit, little bit squirrely, a little bit dangerous, but maybe on a pullback it might be worth a shot. Now, keep in mind, it's going to be a wild ride on that one. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll allow it on a pullback. C and IT. We talk about that one? Yeah, you got a nice little knockout move. This is kind of an extreme stock as far as the knockout is. It's sort of all over the place, so I would pass because of the actual longer term. But if it was in a more established uptrend, if all of a scene was this, OK, as a more volatile stock, I'd say, OK, yeah, you can put an entry up here and a stop right here. But longer term, I don't like the action because it's kind of all over the place and you're just approaching your prior highs in here. So I would pass on that. But it is kind of interesting and initially catches my eye when I'm just looking at uh, this chart here. And let me show you why. It kind of reminds me to some extent of like CTLT from a while back. Notice that it kind of worked its way higher and then it began to accelerate higher. It got a little far, far ahead of itself that, bam, gets a big knockout move today. So that's kind of an interesting pattern. A knockout's a little bit extreme, maybe too extreme, but it's kind of, it's kind of a, 
drives a point home about like stock getting ahead of itself, getting knocked out. If it could survive that move lower, and I think it was CTLT or CLDX. I get them confused. The CTL, no, CTLT were long. CLDX, CLDX. A while back when we had that nice little TKO there. And the beauty of a pattern like that is sometimes sometimes you get a if it does it, it sometimes it won't even trigger out of that uh oh there it is right there i got it marked in okay see it reminds me of that because you had this nice little gradual uptrend and then you had an accelerated move higher i mean i've talked about this pattern a lot in the stock a lot because of this and but notice that the knockout doesn't give up all of that trend and notice that the stock closes fairly well by the end of the day so that's a little bit too extreme example, but it, it's sort of in the spirit of something that's cool and that it's an accelerating trend. It has a knockout. I mean, if, if you don't walk away with anything today, take a snapshot of this chart here and uh, post it and hang on to it because that's a beautiful pattern there. But it was a little too extreme in that other one. It's almost, but the beauty is I doubt it would ever trigger. So, it might be worth a shot in that standpoint. Now it is super thin. And again, I would pass personally because it's too wide and loose and crazy longer term. All right, we've got time for just a couple more. Nate, AMCN, a little while on HV. All right. As long as you know the beast going in. Yeah, maybe a little pullback, maybe. Uh, 124, kind of crazy on an HV. Um, it's also ran up about 400% over a fairly, fairly short period of time, hence the high HV. So be super careful on that one. SUM, we'll do one or two more and we have to shut it down. Yeah, this one's been on my momentum list forever. Uh, on a pullback, absolutely. It's an IPO. It's got everything going for it. Uh, as we talked about quite a bit in the courses and all, your first breakouts in IPOs can be a, a really cool pattern. If you don't walk away with anything today, look to play first breakouts in IPOs. <laughs> Try to give you guys a couple of gems today. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, on a pullback, that could uh, certainly be a good uh, good stock. Let's take one more. Uh, HMST, maybe two. H HMST. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, it's a bank. Kind of hard to get excited about a bank. HV, see, we just had a stock at an HV of 124. This has a stock at HV of 24. So I'd probably pass based on that. It's also, did I say pass? My cage just slipped out. It's also a bit of a thinner stock, so I'd be uh, careful on that. All right, last one for Art, S-E-D-G, because Art's been waiting patiently. Yeah, on a pullback. Uh, this is one we've been watching. This is one that got away from us too. Uh, but it also had a little bit of a breakout characteristic early on. But yeah, it's an IPO. Maybe a little bit more pullback though. Let it have a little more pullback. But absolutely, that needs to go in your uh, your watch list. And I think it's on my momentum list, if uh, memory serves. I think that's uh, I think that's it. The recording gets a little tough around an hour and a half to manage. So let me go ahead and shut things down. Um, I love doing these shows. Thank you, Nate. Uh, I have a blast doing them, as you can tell. And uh, as long as you guys continue to show up, I'll continue to do these shows. So thank you so much. And if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, obviously, please like it and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks, everyone. Uh, any unanswered questions, shoot me an email. Or um, come to the next week's show and be happy to answer it. Thank you so much.